Welcome. Good to see everybody. Brochim Abayim. Blessed are those who are coming to join us. This is uh, B'nai Noach Connection with Israel uh, from Spot Israel Tour for the Nations. This is Peshach Sherbo, co-host Terry Hayes. And we have with us right now uh, Thomas and Troy, Scotty and Mrs. Scotty, I guess, and Veronica. We're glad that the regulars are here. Hope to see more show up here shortly. Today is in Israel, the 5th of September, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And I did a search for somebody on New Zealand. It's around noon New Zealand time right now. So if anybody over there is uh, watching or listening, we appreciate you being with us. What we do here every week is we just have discussion, we answer questions, and we're following right now uh, where the seven commandments or directives or categories of universal laws come from, uh, from the Tanakh. And that's what we talk about. We're going to be talking about tonight, uh, do not commit murder or injury. But before we start that, I want to read a little bit from the Torah portion, Lech Lecha. Now, it's, we're way out of sync of when, when we actually read it during the year. But the interesting thing is, this is the month of Elul, uh, or Elul in, in uh, Hebrew. What is that month? That's the month before Rosh Hashanah, the, before the beginning of the year, before the creation. Um, we've gone through 10, 10 months, 11, this is, no, this is the 12th month of um, living since last Rosh Hashanah. And it's a month of introspection where we're supposed to look at ourselves and see what, what the, how we did, what did we do last year? Are we better shaped this year? Did we do okay? Or what do we have to correct ourselves on for the next coming year? Now, we, we go through this a lot, uh, uh, Israel, the Jews go through this a lot because one of the things we remember all the time is God wants constant progression from us. He's not looking for perfection, but progression, moving forward in our relationship with him. And if we're the same way we are today as we were tomorrow, we didn't progress. If we haven't worked on something in ourselves to make ourselves better, and uh, ourselves better, we haven't done anything. We've stayed static. We haven't lived. Oh yeah, okay. Today I went. Uh, I went for a trip. I visited something. I went on a new roller coaster. I did a skydive. I did something exciting and new. But that's not what this is about. This is about on the level of spiritual level, interacting with God and with hum human beings. Did I do okay? Did I not? hurt anybody today? Did I not murder anybody today? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But the whole month we go through it. And as we do the countdown to Rosh Hashanah, which we're coming up to here, first to Tishrei, uh, in about uh, 25 days, we do introspection. How do we do it? Every day we go through our morning prayers, we add a couple of uh, psalms in there in the mornings. Uh, psalms are always great. And before I go any further, I want to say that uh, tonight's teaching is um, dedicated to uh, healing or prevention of more sickness to my sister-in-law, Donna, and we're doing it in her honor. And if you would like a teaching to be done or if you, if for a healing or for remembrance of someone's who's passed, um, and, uh, then just let us know before the program, send us a message or something, and we can do it in their honor. And I'll go into a big, long thing about that later, about why we do this. But today it's for Donna, we're doing this, and she's in the hospital, and... Uh, we're, we're, we want a complete total healing for her uh, quickly, and that's why we're doing it in her honor tonight, the, the, the teaching. So, 
Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha means, God tells Abraham, Lech Lecha, which means go to yourself or go further. Lech Lecha. And this is something that was told to Avram before he was Avraham, before he, God changed his name. He talked to Avram and Sari, that was Sarah's name before her name was changed. Uh, and it reads, it reads like this. And by the way, this is um, uh, from the, the, the weekly Torah portion, uh, Lech Lecha, which is, I think it's Genesis 12.1. Now, there's two different ways it reads, and I'll read it to you. Let me see if I can. Oh, yeah, here it goes. Uh, Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said to Avram, go forth from your land and from your birthplace, from your father's house to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I will aggrandize your name, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and, and Abram was nearly 75 years old when he left Haran. Now, I'm going to read what we call an interpolation. In other words, it mixes, as we read it, it's going to mix in some actual facts into it that help us learn. And this is from the Kahot version of uh, uh, the Tanakh, it's published by Chabad, and it says in Genesis 12:1, in the year 2023, God said to Abraham, "You have already left your homeland and birthplace by moving to Haran. Now go even further away from your land and from your per for birthplace. Go away from your father Terah's house in Haran." This is just the first verse. Now, there's some interesting points here. God says to Abraham, you already left your home place and birth, your homeland and birthplace by moving to Haran. Now, uh, when Abraham first, God first told him to move, he was in Ur Kazdim. He left Ur Kazdim and went to Haran. But he went to Haran with his father and with a bunch of his family. And that was good. But God said, that's not good enough. He says, now I want you to go, go away from, f further from your land and from your birthplace. Go away from your father Terach's house that is in Haran. Um, now, it, it, it's, Terach was a closet uh, monotheist. He was a closet believer in God, the one God, but he still served idols, taking no steps to reform his idolatrous society. God told Avram to leave the detrimental environment of his home, even though Avram himself knew Terach's secret. <clears throat> and God went on and said, follow my directions to the land which I will show you. By keeping Avram actually in suspense over what is the exact destination. So, uh, um, God endured, endeared the land to where he was going to and enabled uh, Avram to receive reward for trusting him implicitly. And then in verse 2, it says, God said, I promise that the move will be to your benefit. Firstly, you will enjoy the immediate benefit of distancing yourself from the unwholesome, idolatrous environment of Haran. Secondly, even though traveling generally decreases the odds of having children, and since you're childless and you're hesitant to make the journey, be assured I'll make you and your wife fertile in your new home uh, if you stay there. You will continue, if you don't stay there, you will continue to remain childless if you don't go there. Thirdly, if you undertake this journey, I will multiply your offspring and make you into a great nation. Fourthly, even though traveling involves many expenses, I'll bless you with wealth in your new home. Number five, even though traveling usually 
adversely affects a person's renown as he is forgotten in his former home, is not yet established in his new home, I will make your name great and famous. And six, you'll become a source of blessing to people. Now, this is all a physical type thing. We're all, we're all know what it is to move to a new neighborhood, a new town, a new country, even some of us know. When I moved to Israel, my biggest aggravation a long, long time ago was I wasn't familiar with the language. And if I wanted to buy a screwdriver or a plier or a bottle of Clorox, I didn't know where to go. So you spent time hunting, looking for where can I go and where's the hardware store? Is there such a thing as a hardware store? Do I have to go to three different stores to buy stuff? Where can I buy my food and things like that? And, and you, it's an aggravation to you learn and you get used to it. Now, when I was moved from town to town in Israel, already I knew that, okay, if I wanted this type item, I went to this store. If I wanted a different type item, I went to a different store. And, you know, you want a bottle of aspirin, you can't go into uh, the mini market or you can't go into a, a, um, a supermarket and you're not on the shelves there. The only place you could buy aspirin or Advil or uh, any of that stuff was only in a pharmacy. Only a pharmacy could sell those type of things. It's still that way today in Israel. But you learn where you go to get things, what you need, where it is. Now, this is all physical stuff. Let's go back a minute and let's look at this thing in a spiritual manner. In 12.1, God says to Avram, you already left your homeland and birthplace by moving to Haran. Now go even further away from your home and from your birthplace. Well, many people are leaving their religions today, and they're coming into seven universal laws, no hides if you want to call it that, whatever you want to call it. People call it different names. They don't like to be called no hide. They want to be called something else. I prefer that they are working on becoming righteous of the nations. But we'll call it Noahide because everybody's calling it right now. All right, you've left your homeland. What's your homeland? How you grew up? The 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 uh, uh, church influence or the mosque influence or what, whatever influence you come from, and you move to start starting to learn about the Noahide stuff. You start off doing it, and you're still doing it, thinking about it the way you were taught to think where you grew up in the society you grew up in, the church you grew up in, the mosque you grew up in, the temple you grew up in, whatever it is. So you've gotten part of the way. But God says to Abraham, now go even further away from your land in your first birthplace. Go away from your father's house. So God's telling us spiritually, it's not good enough just to move out of that particular environment into a new environment and carry the old baggage with us, the old stuff, the old way of thinking. We have to start letting it go, what our fathers taught us in the society we grew up, what, how it taught us how to think. We have to go even further away than what we've gone, and we have to start looking more deeply into what our Creator our King, our Father, our God, what He wants from us. Now, it says here, uh, your move will benefit you, God is saying. Firstly, you're going to enjoy the benefit of distancing yourself, distancing yourself from the unwholesome, idolatrous, idolatrous environment of Haran. Now, I'm not saying anybody came from idolatry, but you came from an unwholesome way of thinking and teaching that is great if you want to stay where you are, but can't be carried with you, it's, it, it's to the new place you're going. You know, when Shira came with me to Israel, she, she laughs about it today. She says, I moved with three suitcases. I just threw in there what I needed and came. 
this is what we got to do with when we leave where we were to come to be where God wants us to be. We have to leave our baggage behind. Don't need a lift. Don't need 18 suitcases. Uh, my granddaughter told me as she was moving to, to Tallahassee. I guess I think that's where it is, University of Florida or Florida University. Uh, she just moved there a couple of weeks ago. That She's going to three suitcases. Well, the three turned into five or six. <laughs> so she carried some stuff with her. But as we spiritually move and want to move closer to our creator, what we have to do is start leaving pieces behind so we're taking less and less luggage with us spiritually. That we're, we're willing to open ourselves up and, and get moving. So when we read this, this Torah portion, Lech Lecha, go into yourself, or Lech Go Lecha, to, to yourself, God's telling us the same thing. He's making promises to us, and he's going to bless us when we do this. Now, in verse 4, it says, uh, Avram set out as God had directed him, and Lot went with him. Lot is, uh, he kind of adopted him, his, his brother's son. And he took him with him. Lot wanted to go. He didn't have any choice. He couldn't just say, no, get out of here. But he didn't completely leave all his baggage behind. He took part of his baggage with him, which was Lot. Uh, and this was in Abraham's 75th year of his life when he left Haran, when he, he, he left uh, uh, Urkazdim, went to Haran. With him, he took a whole bunch of baggage, relatives, father, moved their house, all that kind of stuff. Then God says, not good enough. I need you to move even further. You're supposed to leave everything behind, but Abraham didn't. He took a lot with him. I choose Avram or Abram at the time he did this. Now, Terach, his father, was 145 years old at the time, and he lives, lives another 60 years. So uh, he didn't want... Uh, uh, the, the Torah tells us of uh, Avram's departure... Uh, and it tells us of Terach's death before the departure, but it, that's not how it happened chronologically. You know why? The Torah tells us of his death before it tells us of Abraham's, Avram's departure in order not to highlight the fact that God prevented Avram from filling his filial obligation of parental respect by making him leave his father unattended or defend for himself in his old age. So 60 years before Avram's father died, he moved. He had to detach himself. It didn't mean that he didn't, wasn't giving his honor to his father, but who do we give honor to, number one, before everything, who we're supposed to think about is God. You know, uh, um, it's important that you realize in your own life, especially when you're married, because this, 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 this is a little tough, but you think of your wife all the time at work, at home, when you go to the store, you always have your wife in mind to make sure you're not doing something that she doesn't want you to do. She's doing the same thing. And we kind of put that person that we love as number one. And sometimes we forget during the day or we forget during a week that, wait a minute, that person is number two. God is number one. And our wife, our spouse, the person we're in love with is number two. So first we have to do our, uh, our obligation to God. Then we do our obligation to our wife, our husband, or whoever else. 
why why first to God? Because if we do first to God, we do better for our number two. We don't, maybe don't, you know, first five years of marriage are the worst part because you're always going through arguments and adjusting to each other. If you make it through the first five years, things get real, usually get more peaceful and so forth. But the more you keep God in mind, the quicker it becomes peaceful because one of the things we're supposed to do is have shalom by it, peace in the house. It's one of the, besides following God, the number, the, the greatest thing you can do is have peace in the walls of your house. Because you have peace there, you have peace in every part of your life. So, but God tells us, here's what you do, and here you have peace in the house. And then number two comes in, and you do whatever you need to do for number two, as long as it doesn't interfere with number one. Since I became religious, in quotes, I go pray three times a day. My Shabbat is filled with things I have to do for God. Shira has the same obligation on Shabbat during the week. Women are kind of exempt from that because they're not, they don't have to do the time-bound commandments for God because they're too busy taking care of their husbands and their their and their children and the sick and the elderly and cooking meals and take all that kind of stuff. So God says, you do that first and then pray to me, then take care of me. You don't have to have a certain time. You have to do things as guys. He doesn't want us to be idle. He doesn't want us to be loafers. And he says, now you're going to do things by the clock, by the day, by the week, by the month and by the year. And you're going to do this work for me. And we have to, to do it and then if the wife says I need I need you to run to the store or I need you to fix something in the house you have to arrange it around the that type of thing you have to arrange your your work around it and and the wife should understand that this is number one in my life is God number two is you I love you very much but God tells me now I'm talking about a Jew I'm not talking about anyone else right now I'm talking the way I live so it has to be understanding on, on both sides. So how do we get to what I'm saying here? That, that although Terach was 145 years old when God said, leave and go from Haran, uh, he wasn't disrespecting his father. It was okay that he did it because God gave him a specific order to leave Haran. Now, he took with him Lot, I mentioned that before, and the possessions they, they acquired as well as the souls they had acquired in Haran, in other words, the people he had converted to be monotheists and so forth. And they set out following God's direction, heading toward Canaan, and they entered Canaan. Now, in the portion of Lech Lecha, I'm going to stop right here, but the por important thing here is, is you remember, if you read on, what happens when, as they're living there Lot's shepherds and uh, Avram's shepherds get a dispute over pasture land. And boy, Avram was real quick to say, okay, let's what? Let's stop the dispute. You go your way. I'll go my way. Because remember, God had told him to disconnect from everybody. And Abraham even told him, look, pick whatever you want to choose. You first pick, and I'll go the other way. So when Lot finally left and went his way, and as we know, he went through to Stom and Gomorrah and then down in that area to Sodom and Gomorrah, I think it's in English. Uh, the total final separation happened in God's original words that he told, uh, um, told Abraham when he says, uh, go away from your land go away from your birthplace, go away from your father's house, go leave everything behind that, that you had learned before. And we're talking now spiritually. Leave everything behind and just learn from me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to bless you. And because he did what he did, it says in the Torah that God accredited, it, it, it was credited to him as uh, his faith was credited to him as righteousness. 
Now, I've talked about this before. There's two ways to read that verse because it says him and he. It doesn't say God and Abraham. So you could say that Abraham was, uh, that God was crediting Abraham and telling him he's a righteous person because he did what he's supposed to do. Or it can be that Abraham is saying God is righteous because he's faithfully doing what he said he was going to do for me. So it's just two ways to read it, not just one way. Both ways sound great. They're, they're, they're great uh, uh, um, ways to interpret it. But why am I talking about Lech Lecha? When you leave where you were spiritually, you have to allow that part of you inside that is connected to God and we call it the nishama. The nefesh is your soul that runs your body. The nishama is the godly, godly part of you that is connected directly to God that's eternal in you, which means you're eternal. And we have to allow that to take control. We have to connect everything with God. If God says do this, we do it. If he says don't do this, we don't do it. So you leave, leave your homeland. Let's call that wherever you were before. We became a Noahide. And what, if you look at yourself or you look at other people taking the journey, uh, yes, it is the one after Noah. <laughs> right after Noah is Lech Lecha. As you do this, you have to realize you have to let go of what you think you know or what you knew until now. You have to let it go. You have to say, okay, now we see groups all over Facebook of people leaving Christianity. They don't do it. The Muslims don't do it because they're afraid somebody's going to beat them up. So they don't, they're not as vocal. Uh, but the Christians look back on where they were, and they get upset, they get angry, I've been lied to, and they, they, they kind of grab a hold of this thing as an excuse for, for not being where they need to be and keep looking backward. This is a time God says, let go. Just let it go. I want you and your mind and, and your soul to be concerned with where you're going, not with where you have been. And you couldn't move forward unless you were at the point you were at right at that moment. Abraham went through a whole lot of stuff in his life. He went and he even learned from Shem. Uh, in the tents of Shem, the seven universal laws, he went and learned from him also. So did Isaac and Jacob. The, the, he, God says, I don't care where you've been. You're now with me. Let me take control. Turn yourself over to me. Let me guide you through the rest of it. Those people that come out of, and, and even Jews that we call Hoser Batruva, come back to being with God, we hang on to stuff sometimes. We've got to get rid of the baggage. we got to get rid of it and just turn and face forward, and it doesn't make any difference. You know, when I came back to being a, came to being a religious Jew, I said, yeah, why did you wait all these years? Why did I have to do it when I was old? Why couldn't I have done it when I was 18 years old or 12 years old or 15 years old? And I asked and asked the question, and I realized I'm asking a silly question. Because of what we call divine providence or God, what God wants from me as an individual, I'm right where I'm supposed to be, and everything I went through in life brought me to this point where I'm connecting closer to God. My love and fear of God is growing stronger every day. I don't need to be looking backwards. I don't have to be asking silly questions about why did you wait till now or this, that, and the other thing. And not, I don't have to compare with where I am now with where I was. I just have to disconnect. Okay, it's history. It's like yesterday's stuff you did yesterday. This morning, the next morning when you wake up, you just forget it. You did your list for the day of chores and things you needed to do, and you got to start the new day with new things to do. It's a new day. 
God is telling us, go further away from your land. Go away from your birthplace. Go away from your father. What does this mean? Leave the things that you were taught as you were growing up behind. Be new. Be fresh. It's a new relationship. It's not new, but it's one you've discovered that you can make stronger so I can bless you and make you stronger. And you can go forward with me through the rest of this life and on to the next level of life, which some people say, oh, it's salvation, which is a wrong interpretation of the word salvation. It's simply the next level of life because you're created as an eternal being in the God part of you where you're connected to God. That's eternal. God's eternal. You're there. You're eternal. So it's important that you remember these things. So as you're learning, as you hear teachings, open up the teachings, let them flow into you. Don't, don't, don't think about, don't think about how does this compare with where I was? Is this right? Is it wrong? Let it enter into you. And let it enter you on the simple level. Believe me, as you learn, and what happens is you enter, en, end up entering a cycle of learning, where next year you're going to learn the same thing all over again, but you know, surprise, surprise, there's going to be new things in it that you don't see this year. Be, what happens? Why? Because your level of understanding of what's being said grows as you gather information. The first time you read through it, it's, you're supposed to just read it. You're not supposed to ask any questions. Just how we start yeshiva students. Don't ask this question. Just read. Don't think about it. Just read it. Now, wait a minute. I'm 55 years old or I'm 60 years old. Why can't I think about it? You know, I have life experience. This is going to help me through these things. I've learned all kinds of stuff. Well, if you want to take all the, all the kinds of stuff and hook it to what you're learning and then come out with something you want it to be, you're not going anywhere. You're just treading water. The whole idea of the connection with your creator, with God, with our Father and our King, is to allow him to influence our life and show us how to think and not for us to tell him, well, I think this and I think that. I'm very famous among my students that I've been teaching for years, and they know what I mean when I say, don't think, learn. <laughs> Until I understood what I was saying, it took me quite a while, because we think all day long, every day. The minute we say, I think, and, and give an opinion, or, or, or think that you know something about God and about what he wants, then you're, you end up, you're interpreting. You're not learning. It's very clear. The, the third on this list I have of Noahide, or the seven universal laws, let's to put it that way, is do not commit murder or injury. And it says here, and Leviticus 24, 10 to 17, relates the incident of a Jew violated an injunction. Of, of, that was in Exodus 22, 27, and bla blasphemed in anger. And in Leviticus 24, 15, it says, ish, ish. No, uh, sorry, I'm reading from the wrong place. Do not commit murder or injury. The edict against murder and punishment of this transgression is in Genesis 9, 5, and 6. Uh, of a man for his brother, I... God will demand the soul of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man among men, his blood will be shed for the image of God he made man. And that's where it comes from. But let's talk what he's saying here. The simple is murder. Don't commit murder. In most texts that are not Jewish, don't come from the Torah or from the Jewish teachings, it says don't kill. Huge difference between kill and murder. Killing happens in war. Killing happens 
at various times, but there's there's never such thing as a permitted time to kill people unless you're defending yourself. You can't go attack them and kill them. Totally forbidden. Now we're talking about killing, physically killing a person. Okay, I'm not going to kill or injure that person. I'm not going to beat them up, and I'm not going to smack them in the head, and I'm not going to ambush them. Okay, great. That fulfills that. Well, no, it doesn't. You can murder a person in many, many different ways. If you say to a friend, hey, you know, so-and-so, they're, they're doing this, that, and the other thing, and the person says, no, nah, that person can't be doing that. That person is too, I know this person, da 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 And then the, the person you told it to starts thinking, this is, wow, this guy's doing this, you know, I can't associate with them or I can't do this or, or, or I want, don't want to listen to them anymore. Whatever happens, it could be a neighbor, it could be anything, any other person. Then the person that was told to tell somebody else, you tell somebody else, you tell somebody else. This is murder of a person's name, of their reputation. It's not for us to do that. Actually, it's called in, uh, uh, um, in the Torah, Lashon Habra, or the bad tongue. Lashon is tongue, ha the ra bad. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, it's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but in Hebrew, it has, it's, it's, it has two different meanings here. Lashon Habra, the tongue that talks bad, even if it's truth, but you talk bad about somebody, you know something they did and you're telling other people is considered a bad tongue. But there's also a play on words here. Lashon Hara means a tongue that spews, uh, um, that it puts out waste product from your body. I won't use the name of the waste product, but you're, you're spreading stuff. You've heard some people, somebody might say, well, this person's got diarrhea of the mouth or something. Well, it comes from that too, the Shon Hara. That's another way to kill somebody. You can, there's, and, and it says be kind, don't injure them. You don't embarrass somebody. The list goes on and on from Torah, what it means not to murder someone. And it's physical murder. You're intentionally doing something to this person. You've, you've laid in wait. You've ambushed the person. That's why when you see a lot of times on, on uh, uh some of the Facebook groups, somebody saying, well, this guy says this and it's no good. And I don't believe what this guy says. And this is, they're actually murdering this person in front of people. They're affecting the way people think about them and what they say and what they teach. We don't do it. I know on, on some of the posts I read, um, I don't respond to them at all because there's a reason I don't respond. The reason is, I don't want to get involved in it. Those people want to think that way, that's fine. I don't have to debate them. I don't have to try to correct them. They have to do it to their own thinking. They have to fix their part of the world where they got a problem. It's not my job to fix for them, that type of thing. My job is I come and teach, I give out information, people want to use it, fine. If they don't want to use it, that's okay with me. Free choice. That's one of the greatest things that God ever gave us, is free choice. We aren't robots, we aren't puppets. So whatever anybody thinks, I say, okay, you can think what you want, but don't think about what God says, but they still do. <laughs> Excuse me, you've all seen it in groups you belong to. You've all seen teachers teach it. You've all seen uh, 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 big debates start on the internet over things. Um, 
and how they should be taught or how much should be taught and this and that and the other thing. What you're doing is when you attack someone, you're murdering them in somebody else's eyes. You're being unkind. You're not doing what you're supposed to do to that person or in a proper way of relating with him. If you want to go and talk to somebody in private, do so. But there's a, the Baal Shem Tov and the, and the Fredika Rebbe and the Alta Rebbe and, and, and all the Rebbe's that I follow in Chabad, they all say the same thing. When you go to someone who is doing something wrong or not thinking in a proper manner, if they don't understand what you're saying or they rebel against it, it's not because it's not their problem, it's yours. Because you didn't go to them with the right heart with the right mind, you first have to go to somebody as a friend. You first have to have compassion for the person. You have to speak from your heart because from your heart, uh, uh, it goes to the, the, the godly part of you, which speaks to their godly part. If they don't understand what you're saying or they want to debate or argue about what you're saying, it's not because they're not understanding, it's because you're not saying it properly. You're not speaking to their heart. Now, that's a harsh statement to say. We all know people, we just want so much for them to understand what we're saying. But sometimes you got to back up and think about how we're doing things. The loudest speaking you can do to anybody is through your actions. We have scholars that study Torah all day long. And they study all the sages and they, put, they, they gather information and give it to us so we don't have to do, sit the, all those long hours to, to collect information and put it, I mean, like, the, read the, the homash. Man, it's so out of chronological order. Uh, and they'll tell us, okay, this is the order things actually happened in, because sometimes it, it's over here, he's, God says something, and it, had, it, it, it happened a long time ago, and he's just telling us about it now, or things like that. The, if you go into uh, uh, Judges or Kings or the Chronicles, you get a historical understanding of what happened. If you go into Prophets, you, you don't have the same chronological historical thing. So we have to look at each thing, take in the information, and then we have to find out if we want what order and all those other things. Now, how do, how do we know it and what we study now in, in Israel, the Jews? Because we've had somebody helping us for 3,300 years do it. You could have grown up with God and think you know God. Oh, I'm 60 years old. I know all about this Old Testament stuff. I've read it I don't know how many times. The minute you say that, you're wrong. What you haven't done is left your father's home yet. You haven't left where you were and approached it with new learning. And it's okay to do that. And it's okay if you learn something that, that you thought you knew, but wait a minute. What you realized is you thought you thought something was this way and you just let it go. Some people never do. One of the biggest things I see in a lot of Noahi groups is anti-Semitism, hate for the Jews. How? Got me. They were taught it every Sunday, every time they went to school in some Christian learning place, how bad we were and how, not, how stiff-necked we were and don't listen to us, but that's a mistake. Some Noahi groups don't allow Jews to belong to it at all. They're going to do it their way. Off subject. But what they're doing is murder. They're affecting the way other people look at a live, living truth, and they're turning people away from it. So what have they done? They've murdered, in that person's eyes, the truth. They don't look at it that way. They want to preach their own truths. 
Murder is a huge subject. You know that if someone, if I'm going to chop a tree down and I draw back on my axe and pull it forward, if the top flips off and hits somebody behind me and I kill them, it's murder. It's a type of murder. Now, it's not the type of murder where, where the death penalty is involved. The death penalty is involved with if you lie in wait and plan and go out and kill somebody. And even then, the death penalty doesn't usually apply in every case. But it's not talking about just that type of murder. There's all different ways to murder someone, spiritually and physically. How you act can murder them. Just like, I'm going to chop a tree down. i got to chop this tree down. I'm helping a friend out build a house. And we're going to get some wood off of it and planks. And, and a head flies off, and I intentionally, without even any forethought, I've killed a human being, someone who is in the image of God. Well, I might do something to someone. Let's say uh, uh, someone cuts in front of me in line in the checkout counter. What are you doing? Get the hell back the end of the line. Yeah, what do you think? Is something special? You're murdering that person because you're making him feel bad. And they look at you, who's supposed to be a God-fearing, God-believing person, and you're being nasty to them. That's a type of murder. Because they look at you and say, what do I want to be like that person for? What do I have to believe in God to act like that for? But what kind of, do I have to be a human being to be like that for? Or somebody can cut in front of you in a line, and you say, excuse me, but, you know, there's a line here. Well, I'm in a hurry. So you say, you can say to the person, well, it doesn't look like you have a lot of stuff in your shopping cart. Go in front of me if everybody agrees. Whatever. Something like that. There's different ways to do things. The tongue is a murderer. It kills things all day long. It kills people's uh, faith. It kills people's learning. It kills people's thoughts. So when we see this category of do not commit murder or injury, it covers all of these things. We don't think about it. As soon as we hear murder, well, I'm not a murderer. I don't go around killing people. How many times have you heard that from somebody? I'm a good guy. I don't go around murdering people all day long. I've never murdered anybody in my life. So they, this word murder, we focus in on and don't realize all the different things that are involved in murder. And this is important for us to remember that it's not only with this, this category, this command, or this universal law, don't murder or injure. With everyone we read, it's the same way. There's such a depth to it. As a matter of fact, and I went to my office this week and I was looking all around and I can't find, I got to find it in my computer now. I did a breakdown of the seven universal laws. You know, we all hear about the 613 laws that the Jews do. Well, not a one of us does 613. We can't. It's physically impossible. But within the Jewish nation, within Israel, the, the, this guy over here, the Cohen does his part, and the Levite does his, the doctor does his, the judge does his, the guy that cuts the grass does his, the guy that grinds the flour does his. And between us all as a group, we do the 613. The Cohen's doing it for me, the Levite's doing it for me, the doctor's doing healings for me, the accountant and, or, or the businessman that does honest business is doing it for me. And I just have to be responsible for the ones I know I'm responsible for, which end up being about 250 or 60. Those are from the Ten Commandments, right? From the seven universal laws of Noah, how many, how does, how does it separate to the, the 613 that are in the Torah? About 220 things that you're supposed to do and not violate. And I have to redo the list, and I will publish it in, 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 a, in a readable 
proper format here very shortly. Uh, I'm working on it. But understand that each one of these things is so deep. But, but it's, it's okay if you want to think about what's in there. But what you want to do is learn about what's in there. And there's reasons why each thing is talked about, reasons that God puts down. You know, I talked about uh, um, how God tells us things in the Torah, not only from the actual words we read, but you look at a Torah scroll and even how things are written. Last week we talked about the Shema, I think it was. Shema Yisrael. Uh, Adonai Elokeinu Adonai Achad, where uh, at the end of Shema there's an ayin, which is big when you look at it in the Torah, and Achad has like a dalit or a d at the end, so it's like ad. Well, ad doesn't mean after death. The word ed in Hebrew means witness. So every time you say Shema Israel Adonai Elokeinu Adonai Achad, you're saying or being a witness that God is one. There is no other God. It's only Him. Every time you say those words. So within the, the letters, it means something. There's more things to learn. And there's even more things to learn about the way it was written. This month, which I mentioned at the beginning, Elul, in English we say E-L-U-L. In Hebrew, it comes out to an, an acronym, which means Ani Lododi Lododi Li. I am to my love, my Lord, and he is to me. In other words, you're, this month, this month that we're going through right now, where we do a retrospection over the year and see how we can make ourselves a better person, and we can fix ourselves even more inside, Plus, we go around to people that we realize, wait a minute, I didn't think about it when I said it three months ago, but I hurt that person when I said that. And I go to that person and I apologize for what I did, the nasty way I said something. You know, uh, this week in Shoal, during morning services, there was a guy there and I, I went up to him and I said, you know, um, I think you and I have maybe a problem between us. I said, can you tell me what it is? I actually asked him. He says, funny you should mention that. <laughs> now, him and I have known each other for like three, four years. We were at a wedding about three weeks ago. And because the guy that was getting married, nobody really knew. But the wife, he's new here in Spot. The wife has been here for years and years and years, and all the women knew her. So when you got to the wedding hall, all the place is filled with women on the one side, and the guys filled up one table. And there must have been, I don't know, 70 or 80 women there. And I kind of felt sorry for the guy. And so I wanted to make him a little happy. I wanted him to smile. I wanted him to feel like part of the group. So this guy said something on the microphone, and I thought he was finished speaking, so I went up to him, may I say something? Well, he informed me the other morning, he said, why did you interrupt me at the wedding? I said, oh, oh my goodness, I thought you were finished speaking, I apologize. I asked permission, you could have said, wait, wait a few minutes, but I'm sorry I, I interrupted you. But he was holding this inside of him that I had done something wrong, which I didn't even realize. I apologized to him, we talked, we hugged each other, and everything's cool. But this can happen to you, or could have happened to you during the last year where you did something inadvertently, without actually realizing it, you injured somebody, you hurt somebody uh, um, verbally, or you did an action that hurt somebody, you don't even realize it but you feel a difference in your interaction with the person. You should find out and you should apologize, genuinely, genuinely apologize. And even if the person says something, you can't figure out how could the person be possibly offended, you tell them you're sorry anyway. 
you don't try to defend yourself or say, how could you be offended by this or that? People understand things by the way they see them. The last thing you want to do is injure or murder anybody with your tongue or your actions. This is a time of year that the last week before we have Rosh Hashanah, we do uh, special services every single morning early, except for the first time we do it. We have to go at midnight to the Bet Knesset, and we have to, there's a very long service we do. Slichot means asking for forgiveness. We go before God and we start, and what does this do? This jogs our memory to incidences or things that we have to correct from the previous year. And then we go on to the next year with Rosh Hashanah and, and the days of repentance, the days of all between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and then Yom Kippur, of course, is a fast day. And then we go to Sukkot and sit in the sukkah outside and eat our meals and get hugged by God. And we'll talk about that as the time gets closer. So in one thing here, do not commit murder or injury, God has set up a system so that you can make sure that you're operating in the right way. And he's constantly bringing us back to think about it. Every year in the month of Elul, you come into Elul and you say, I, I am to God and he is to me. It's like a commitment. And, and then you think, wait a minute, how did I not do what God wanted during this time? Who did I injure? Who did I even murder? Who did I defame? Who did I not treat properly? One of the things under this, and, and I, it's not part of the, the seven, uh, is not about, it doesn't say honor or love your parents. Like Ten Commandments says honor your parents. If you don't, you know, it doesn't say you have to love your parents, but it says you honor them. And you give them the honor that they're the ones that God chose to bring you into this world. So you're supposed to honor them. It doesn't, if you don't, I wonder how many parents are sitting around the world today, and this is one of the things I can't help counsel people with, so I know there's a lot, the kids don't talk to them. Or that the, once the son or daughter get married, they don't allow the parent to see the grandkids. That's murder. That comes under the category of murder. Now, they're not aware of it, but if you're walking with God, you've got to be aware of it. It's part of your walk. You always honor your parents. If you look at a Ten Commandment tablet, you have the first five and the second five, right? You said five and five. Number five is honor your parents. First four are about God himself. The fifth one is honor your parents. And then, of course, we have the do not, <laughs> the do nots on the other side, the, like the Noahide laws. <coughs> Excuse me. Think about how they're set up. The first four most important things is how you treat your father, your creator, your king, the guy that created all things. Then he's saying... You honor me, I'm your father. You also honor your earthly mother and father. And then he goes on to talk about how we treat each other, the next five. So we got four commandments, how to take care of God. The fifth one is honoring him and our earthly parents because he chose them to give birth to you. Then we go about how we're going to treat all of mankind. So they're set up in a very logical order. Very logical. And we teach young children in, the, in their day schools, in their nursery schools here in Israel, before they get into actually learning the whole Torah and the things that they learn, the very first thing they learn is honoring their parents. Because it, has, it goes right back to honoring God. If you don't honor your parents, then you're not honoring God. 
again, let me make a distinction here. You don't have to love your parents. They don't have to be your best friends. Things happen. But you do have to give them honor. So don't murder your parents in a spiritual way. Don't murder your kids by telling them you're not going to grow up and be a good for nothing or, you're not, you know, why don't you stop getting in all this trouble? Don't murder your other relatives. Don't murder any human being because all human beings are created in God's image. When you look at that human being, no matter who it is, they were created by God in his image. Now, you know that I'm not talking about arms and legs and mouth and feet and stuff like that. They're created, as you and I are created, as a very powerful spiritual being. And when we yell at them, or we get upset at them, or we hate them, or we tell people how bad they are, we're actually defaming our father. Do not murder care covers a lot of things. Okay. <laughs> I think I've about covered what I was going to cover, and I hope somebody has some questions for me uh, right now. Or Terry, you may have something you want to say, or... Well, it's kind of right there at that, that ending there you were talking about. You know, like I studied uh, in the Noahide Laws, like you said, we're not commanded to honor as far as not one of our families. But I think it falls under the obligations. Uh, right. We have a lot of obligations. It's not law. And then I heard someone, or I read someone make an interesting statement, um, another rabbi. He said the Noahide Laws is not as much as law as a guide for life. And I, I, thought exactly. that, I thought that was good. But we've talked in the past, last few weeks actually, about the animal soul and the godly soul. And as you were talking, and I, you know, I have my fellow co-workers that I have tips with, you know, their work ethics and stuff, you know, especially some of the younger ones really get on my nerves. They, you know, when they don't, when they think they don't have anything to do, they look for somewhere else to hide, you know, and instead of there's a lot to do, they just don't want to do it. And I got to thinking, as you were saying, you know, here lately, I've been looking at the animal side of the person. You know, the do not murder, you know, because it's created in the image of God is about the, the godly soul. You know, actually both are tied together. If you take the physical animal and kill it, you're actually attaching, you know, attacking the, the, the godly soul. So I don't know. I've just got to thinking like my own self. If we're in a, a law that I have a tendency to see people through their animal side and not their godly side. And that's an area that I know through what you just said that I need to correct in my, in my own life. That's exactly true. We're, we're actually... Uh, forbidden to j judge somebody or do something unless they've actually like have they actually committed physical murder or something to go around constantly judging people for what their animal soul does. They just they're they, they're just not aware yet. They're they're ignorant of of who's supposed to be in control of this thing we call our body, and they allow the animal part to run the body their whole life. You need to have compassion. You need to help them. So when we look at them, and I always fall back on this one case, do you know that if the whole town sees somebody murder somebody, they arrest them, they take them to trial, unanimous verdict among the judges, because it's not a jury system, it's a judge system, which most of the world uses except America. Um, you sit in a panel of judges, and they decide. The Torah says, first of all, if it's, if it's going to involve the death penalty, you can't make a decision until the next day. In other words, you have to think about it overnight. Then the Torah says, if the judge's verdict is unanimous, the person is set free. Even if everybody knows he did it, saw him do it, everything. Because God says, if there's one person that can't speak up good for that person that's in front of the judges, 
then everybody's eyes are tainted. And they're not talking about seeing eyes. They're talking about the spiritual part of us. No matter what bad a person does, whether it's to you or to other people, there's still something good in that person, and it is incumbent upon us to find what is good in that person. That is why the law in America today, and this comes right from the Torah, says, if you don't, can't afford an attorney, we'll sign one for you. You have to have somebody speak good for you in court. If it's a total unanimous decision that a person is, is, is guilty, he goes free, even if it's a death penalty. So we, you, me, all of us, when we see that person, you know, I, in, in Shul, we need 10 people to do our morning prayers and afternoon and evening prayers. There's certain parts of the prayers you can do without 10 people, but the Amidah, the, 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 the Shwan Asri, the, the 18, we have to do with 10 people in the room. Six of them had to be in the room for, for the first part of the prayer service. Uh, when we do Kaddish, which is a prayer for the dead, it has to be 10 people. When we pray to God, uh, um, the Kaddish, in other words, we're blessing, get, get, thanking God for everything he's done for us, there has to be 10 people. There are times when you're praying with 10 people, and you're about to move into certain parts of the prayer, all of a sudden you see there's only nine in the room. Somebody gets up and walks out. We don't know why he walked out. Maybe he had to be somewhere. Maybe he had to use a restroom. Lots of times guys will say, no, oh, didn't someone so know we're ready to do this? Now we got to wait. They're judging him in the negative immediately. And this happens to us all the time. We judge people in the negative immediately without thinking. What happens when one person walks out and there's only nine of us? Usually someone goes out the front door and pulls in somebody else and says, come on, be the 10th man so we can finish the prayer service. But when the one that walked out, oh, he doesn't care about us. What does he care? He just left the room. We can't finish our prayer service without 10 people in the room. And there are those that judge that person. And it's not good. We're not supposed to think that way. When we see a person left the room, we're not supposed to say, no, that guy doesn't understand this. You know, look what time it is. And there's other people standing here waiting for it to finish a prayer. Instead of saying about the person, gee, I hope there wasn't an emergency. I uh, hope everything's okay. It's okay if he has to go to the restroom in the middle of prayer because actually the tour instruction says if you feel that you need to go to the bathroom, you stop your prayer, you go to the bathroom, and you come back. It's forbidden to hold on or hold it in. You must stop, relieve yourself, and come back. Because what happens when you feel like you, you have to do this, your mind is half on that and half on whatever else you're doing. God says, I want full attention. Even when it comes to that, go take care of it and come back. So that, That's why, uh, well, he, you know, he's, he's passed on now, but uh, one of the men I met at the uh, local uh, Chattanooga show when I was going down there years ago, was he would always tell me, he said, yes, he said, you know, the tenth guy is important, but there's, there's one more that's more important than the tenth. And he said, the eleventh guy. He said, the eleventh guy is more important because if one of the ten has to go to the restroom, the eleventh guy is the really the important guy. <laughs> yeah, that is so true. Uh, of course, I'm not using the language he, he used. He was a plumber most of his life. But, yeah. uh, but he, he made it really clear that the 11th guy was important because there's someone always needs to go to the restroom. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to tell you, for me, because, you know, I'm one of the, what we call ultra cockers, the old guys, there comes a certain point in the service, I start double-checking the camp in the room because <laughs> I know I got to run out. <laughs> And I know about where I'm going to be in the prayer service when I got to run out. <laughs> I've I've stopped drinking coffee in the morning before I go, just so that doesn't happen. It still happens. So, <laughs> I think Thomas has something to say. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I got to go honor my mother who just scared the bejeebies out of me. <laughs>
Uh, I just want to say thank you for the teaching. And uh, oh, I think young lady from New Zealand there, I think it is, or Australia, one of the, one of the two. I'll be watching your video later. <laughs> Y'all take care. Many blessings. God bless. Have a good evening, Thomas. Bye. I uh, now the lady from New Zealand. Be from New Zealand. Take your phone off. Take it. Just says CST. There was it say CST? <laughs> Chrissy, Chrissy. I'm from Australia, Queensland. Ah, so you you have the the website the the Facebook page right about. Yes, Noah, Noah Hodge of Australia, and I've got a. Um, uh, a YouTube channel as well called My Noah Hyde Family. So. Very good. Very Thank good. I, it wasn't quite, it just said CST there and I didn't know what it meant. So, um. Christina Seaton Thompson. It's far too long a name. <laughs> Chrissy, just Chrissy. Okay, Chrissy. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. What time is it there? About 12, 1 o'clock on Thursday? Um, it's, act it's actually um, 10 past 11 Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're you're not in New Zealand. You're in Australia. Yes. Yeah. I'm in. I live in Queensland. In ah, Australia. okay. Because yes. I know somebody asked me what in New Zealand what time the program goes, and I knew it started around noon time there in Australia yeah. time. Yeah, it'd be slightly different. It's not far from us. No. Yeah. Mm. Well, I really appreciate you stopping by. I hope you become a regular. If you have something to contribute, we'd be more than happy no. to. Have I'm happy. I've, I've, I've sort of completely retired from work now, so I'm having a little bit more time to um, devote to the things I want to do. Just excuse my two dogs here. No, that's okay. I teach a group on on uh, Sunday, Monday nights in Virginia. Mm -hmm. It's in a home where they have a little dog about like that one uh, uh, named Oliver. Oh. <laughs> and when, when we fire up the Skype, Oliver always comes up and barks at me and then goes and sits on his pillow, but he always knows when to see, I'm with them two hours teaching every single uh, uh, Monday, Monday night. He knows when it's the end of the two hours because he'll come up and he'll look at the <laughs> screen and bark at me, telling me, okay, your time's over with us. She's got to come take care of me now. <laughs> I have to tell you something funny when uh, I've got two, two little mini foxes and when, when I actually do my morning prayers, they um, they come and sit down near me, and look. It is it's almost eerie at times, but when they see me mouthing the words, they look up like this, and they have this sort of. It's, it's, I have to stop sometimes, and I think, oh, you know, what they're looking looking for something. I don't know, but it's quite touching, really. <laughs> I think they think she's gone crazy. She's talking. To, to someone and we can't see them. I don't know. Well, how about how about I give you a different explanation? Yes. When you go into your prayers and you're you're communicating with the Creator, they know you're communicating with the Creator. That's the same Creator that created them. Well, it's it's interesting you say that. I, I do wonder about it sometimes because it, animals. And we live on a farm, so. I learned so much over the years from animals. It's amazing, you know, how they're so attuned to things that we aren't. They have senses that we, we've we lost sort of thing. Well, God gave them senses so they can, he, they can sense him without having that part of it that is in his image. In other words, without having that connection that we have. Yes. It, yes. When we say our morning prayers, it says all the world will recognize, all the creatures will recognize, everyone will know God. You know, everyone will, will, will worship the Creator in their yes. own way. Mm. And now the animals have that awareness of God. The, they can't think about it, they can't uh, 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 express it. But there are times when they can certainly feel his closeness more than other times. And when you are praying, you're, you're, you, it's called amshacha. You're pulling down his closeness to where you are and to the earth. And they feel th th that closeness coming down. And they can, they'll react to it. Little children will do the same thing because it's yes. built 
it's built into the animal side of us. But what happens with children is we smother it. Yes. Oh, don't be so, uh, go fantasies, don't this, don't that, don't do this, don't, you know. And we smother their natural ability to, look, Abraham, I don't know if you know the whole story of Abraham, which we have in our Jewish texts. Not in, it's not in the Humash because it's not relevant to what God's teaching there. But at four years old, between three and five, he realized there was one God. Mm. And he realized it living in a cave under a castle because there was a, 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 an edict for his death out by Nimrod. Because... Nimrod knew that his nemesis was going to be born, and he, just like the Pharaoh had done, all male children were to be killed. And there's a whole story about how he survived that. Um, and someday if we want to do the teaching on it, we can do it. But it goes through his whole history until he finishes his learning uh, and comes back to be with his dad in the castle there uh, um, with Nimrod. And when Nimrod throws Abraham into the furnace, which most people do, into a fire, uh, flames that God saved him from. Now, most, most people don't know about this because it's not in the Homash. It's not in the five books of Moses. It's in separate writings that we have that were written down uh, probably sometime around the, 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 the first century, according to, or 2,000 years ago. But there was stuff that was taught by the pay, part of the traditions and stories were taught by mouth. So your dogs, your prayer is so strong, and you're pulling God down close to earth that they feel it. That's the other explanation. I had never thought of it quite like that, but... Um... It makes perfect sense, yes. Yes, it does. It makes spiritually, it makes absolute perfect sense. Mm. God does a little something to wake us up. And to a lot of people, it's when he brings them into realizing there's only one God. He, that's a wake-up call. Mm. He doesn't keep throwing information at us. He then waits and says, okay, are you going to do something to pull me down closer to you? And when you pull him down closer, then he gives you more information. Mm. It's a two-way street. It's just like a relationship between a husband and a wife, a child and a father. So the father does something to teach in a very simple manner. And if the child wants more, the child has to ask for it. So the, the, the relationship with God is, okay, here's something to wake you up. Let's see what you do with it. She says, oh, wait a minute. Now, come on, tell me more. I want a better relationship, then you're pulling it down. Mm. And when you pull it down, then what he does, he gives more. He sends more down to you. So it's, 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 a, it's a give and take. Oh, I forgot I had the camera off. <laughs> it's a give and take relationship between you, 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 and your father, your creator, your king, your God. And the more it says in the end, what does it say? The prophecy is very simple. All will know God in the end. Everybody's going to have that kind of relationship with him. That's at the, at the point in time where we've given over our free, what free choice do we have? Have a relationship with him or don't. And in the Torah readings coming up for the, for the, until Rosh Hashanah, we're going to talk about it in the Torah portions where we either choose life. God tells Moses, tell us, or choose life or choose death. I prefer that you choose life. I want that no one should die. Mm -hmm. Now, we think of this in a physical way, but if you think about it spiritually, it's a little bit more frightening. God says you choose life. That's the only real choice you have in your whole life to be with him. I mean, what color shirt we wear, or hat we wear, or what we eat, 
yeah, okay, we call that free choice, but okay, God's not concerned with that unless he's told us specifically, don't eat this or don't eat that, like he did to the Jews. Uh, to, to the other 99.8% uh, of the world, he never gave that instruction. So you're free to eat whatever you want. But the point is, everyone will know him. They will have given up their free choice. They've said, okay, I choose life. The minute you do that, the biggest free choice decision anyone has to make in, the, in their whole existence is there. Why? I prefer you choose life. I wish, I wish everyone will live, God says. Most people think of it as a physical thing. It's not. It's, it, it, it's the spiritual part of us, the idea of who we are. It is a part of God which is inside of us, not the physical body, which is just a container for the other thing just a car or truck or a ship. That's all it is. It just moves us around and allows us to do things. Because the spiritual part can't pick up a prayer book. It can't do the things without controlling the physical part, which means controlling the animal side of us. Once we've decided to live, it's great. But what does this death mean? There's different interpretations of it because or drashes I should say different opinions on it they're all right as far as we're concerned because we don't you can't prove any of them wrong but the one that affects me the most is I'm, I'm going to be 75 here in about four or five months and if I don't choose to live and go on to the next level of life with God what happens to me if I don't make that decision to do that is it that all of a sudden God says, well, you don't want to be with me? You're not, and you never were, and poof, you just never existed, you're gone. To me, that's worse than hell. How would I ever know it? I'll never know it. But that's true death. Do what you got to do to choose life. Does it mean you have to be perfect? No. Does it mean that, that if you do something by accident uh, and not intentionally, uh, are you going to get punished for it? We would go into all those details at another time, but the point is the minute you turn towards God and keep your face turned toward him, the minute you put your foot on the first rung of the ladder that goes up, God says, okay, great. Keep heading that direction because you've, you've decided to, accept my kingship because if you decided to accept me i can say you're righteous now you're the righteous of the nations you're part of what we call the greater israel and you're covered you don't have to be jewish you just have to be a human being and a good human being and what does solomon say and i say this all the time it's in the very last verses of ecclesiastes Fear God, do what he says, and that makes you a complete human being. It's not simple. It's not some big complicated thing. We complicate it sometimes by our thinking. Keep his commandments and fear him, and that makes you complete. That's it. And the verses before that says, oh, there's making of much books, and uh, the reading of much books and studying is wearisome to the soul. Here's the bottom line. You don't have to go into all this. Do what God says to do. Do his commandments and fear him, and you're complete. And that's up to each one of us to complete ourselves. And those are for different lessons. <laughs> we'll get into that eventually. I, I, would, I would like to have us a complete lesson on that, to be honest with you. It would, well, it would be really good on 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 that because just thoughts i've had recently on some things but the the issue of going and being a complete you know person i think would be a, a really good lesson for a lot of people i i believe you're right Did you turn the camera off again i believe you're right 
And but since we're following the, these, we've just covered the third one. We get four more to go. Oh no, I'm not saying like right now, but I think that on our you know our future agenda that would be really good. Are you keeping a list and checking it twice? <laughs> nah. Hey, people do call me that person, but I I, I prefer ZZ Top. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about anybody in particular. Just <laughs> oh, I know. No, no, no. Everybody will come up. Oh, you just need a little one. No, give me a guitar, some dark shades, you know. <laughs> All right. So wait a minute. Let me. Guitar. <laughs> so you're, what you're saying is, um, what did you what, choosing life? Well, that going into real good detail on that passage, you've mentioned it several times there, and. The, uh, you know, oh, in, in Ecclesiastes about being a complete human being. I think that would be a really good discussion, um, and what all that entails. Because here's the reason why I think you know, I, I just left the Noahide group because it just it was becoming frustrating to me to, to see all the stuff going on. But, um, like you said, we complicate the Noahides, the, 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 the ex Christians, ex whatever we were, we have a tendency to complicate this issue, to make it more than what it really is. And, and, and on that, some people will think that's not enough. No, it's really, a, that is enough. And, and we're blessed to be able to see that. But I think we have a tendency to, to complicate things. I mean, hey, look at me. I mean, look, I got my, my, my books. <laughs> We have, you know, a, we have a tendency to keep wanting more and more and more when it's everything we need is right in front of us. Exactly. Well, I would tell you what, for the Jews, it's the same thing. You go into somebody's house, first thing you're confronted with is three, four, five, six bookshelves full of thousands of dollars worth of books, tens of thousands of dollars worth of books. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd heard back when I was on the other side of the fence that if you did go out and do a missionary work and you knocked on a door and you seen a wall full of books, you turn around and leave. <laughs> You're not prepared to answer those questions. <laughs> well, th when they come into my house, it's a disappointment because like I, you know, I came back to the proper path about four, four and a half years ago. I don't have the money to go out and spend up money and buying all those books. So where are those books for me in the computer? Well, and also you're in Safat. I mean, how many synagogues and how you have a uh, you have a, a treasure trove right at, at your front door. Uh, that's true. I walk out my front door. I have uh, five synagogues within uh, four minutes of my house. You know, and, and if I want to walk a little more, there's another five. And if I go up to the old city, every other door is a synagogue, and every one of them has a library. And you can go into any one of them, and and and. And, and they usually have a resident scholar there. If you have a question, where do I look up something? They'll know exactly where to go look it up. And they'll hand you the book and say, have fun. And, and uh, unfortunately, most of them are in Hebrew. Uh, but there's still a lot out there in English. Right. And nobody, this is one of the big, no, well, they don't allow us to learn this stuff. And we can't teach that. We can't learn it under penalty of death. They're speaking to, out of ignorance because you can actually learn whatever you want to learn. Whether you're going to understand it or not is a different story. Whether you have the capabilities to understand it, some people do, some people don't. That's just who God made us all different. Like if I go to Gemara classes, which are all the legal arguments and decisions, I get totally lost in there. I mean, I just, and I've tried three different teachers and I get lost. But if I go on Humash and the Parshat Shavua, I can go to any depth uh, somebody wants to teach me. There's certain things I can understand. There's certain things I can't. That's the way God made me. So, and, and I don't want to go learn it intellectually. If you learn something intellectual, intellectually, you're only learning about one-third of what it's all about. Well, I read this, and it says this. Okay, well, great. Everybody can read that. And it says that. Well, I think, wait a minute, don't think. you got to learn what, what the people that know tell us that this means. I can't make up my own meaning. 
So when I get to the point where I don't understand something and I start to think about it, I say, no, I can't do that. If I don't understand it, I don't understand it. And I don't have to understand it. It's not part of what I have to understand. I can only understand to my own level. It goes back to the old story uh, of the Baal Shem Tov, of the, the Jews that were traveling from one place to another back in the day, and they were going through a forest, and they came to an inn that they knew was owned by a Jewish guy. And so they knew it was kosher, and they decided to stay overnight there. And they asked him to join them for prayers. And he said, no, I can't. I'm busy. I got this to do. I got that to do. And the next morning, they said, well, are you going to join us for prayers? And he says, no, I have to do all these other things. And after he'd served breakfast, he just disappeared. And they said, you know what? We got to see what's going on here. Let's stay a couple more nights. And they would ask him every time they went to prayer the same question. So finally, they got said, look, let's just follow him the next time he leaves after breakfast. Let's go see what he does. And they follow him out into the forest. He goes to a clearing. And they see him standing out there reciting the ABCs, the Aleph Bet. Aleph Bet, Gimel Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion. He's just looking up and giving the Hebrew letters. He's just reciting them. So they scurry back to the inn, and he comes back about a, a half an hour later. And he said, look, we want to be honest with you. We followed you where you went, and we were always asking you to come pray with us. We followed you where you went, and we saw that all, you were standing out there re reciting the alphabet, the alphabet of, uh, of Hebrew. Why? He says, look, he says, you guys can read. I never learned to read. You guys have the money to have your books and your prayer scrolls. I don't have that money. I said, so when I go to pray to God, I give him all the letters and let him put them together because he knows my intent. He puts them together the way he wants. So he understands the intent of my heart. The guys were just astounded by this. Now, this was back in the day when some of the Jews who did Torah learning all day long kind of looked down on the uneducated people, people that couldn't read, people that couldn't do go pray three times a day. So what does this story say? If your heart, if you've accepted God and you, you, you're talking to him, then he understands your intent. And you could be a person that, that maybe you're not mentally capable of putting a sentence together. But if you can do that little bit of thing with intent, he accepts it. And he accepts you and your love for him and he, because he loves you anyway. So it's, it, and that goes for every human being. So if you do and you give your intent to God, and if you pray without intent, as if you didn't pray. And back in the day when we offered sacrifices, which weren't for repentance, by the way, but when we offered sacrifices, if the intent wasn't there that they were for God, we were lifting them up for God, they didn't mean anything. We, we killed an animal for no reason. We murdered that animal. And we intentionally did it. So everything has to do with our intent, the things we do every day, the intent, the intent you give charity, the intent you uh, help somebody. Everything is about intent. Now this month, Elul, as, a, as an aside, we blow the shofar every day after morning services. And I'm so fortunate to have all these synagogues around me that I hear it in the mornings three, four, five different times I hear the shofar blow. And then when I go to shacharit service at 8.30, at then we blow it again after that. And the shofar has a very strong spiritual connotation because that's what people heard at Mount Sinai. And... When Sharon and I first got married, even though I was not 
I fooled you. I wasn't following the path where I was supposed to. I look forward to every Rosh Hashanah hearing that show for blow because it did something to me inside my body. Just there's like this vibration, this connecting back to my ancestors. And I could it didn't happen one Rosh Hashanah, and I got upset about it. Now that she's converted, now that she's been through this, and now that she understands and she gets that feeling also. She says, you know, I understand what you said six years ago or whenever it was. Uh, uh, five years ago, when you were upset, you didn't get that, have that experience that particular year. It's something that vibrates through the godly part of you once you realize what it is and the spiritual connotation of it. It just shakes you up. And the first time she realized it, when she heard it, she just right in the synagogue, back in the woman's section, she started weeping. She couldn't stop weeping. I had to take her home. She laid in bed just weeping, and it shook her up so much, that feeling. This is, when you experience this type of thing, it's just like, wow. Now, you may get it through your prayers. You may get it through a connection with God, but you're going to have it because you're going to know who God is. You don't have to have faith in him. You don't have to believe in him. You know him, just like we all know each other now because we, we've had the experience of meeting each other. You don't have to have believe that I exist in spot. You've seen me. You know. Once you know, you know. There's no more faith involved. The faith that we have in God is he's faithfully going to take care of us the way he said and I'm going to faithfully do what he tells me to do. Faith is an action word. It's not mental mumbo jumbo. And we've talked about that before. Anyway, I could, you know, you get me talking about this stuff. I can go for hours and hours. So uh, I think I'm about where we need to be for this week, unless someone has some more questions. And, I always make this offer at the end of the time period. I should say it in the beginning, just in case somebody doesn't stick through the whole time period that's watching it on the video on YouTube, that anybody that would like, has questions, would like to learn, would like to meet with my wife and I once a week, every two weeks, every 10 days, once a month, let us know. And we'll be more than happy to sit and talk with you and, and help guide you on the path that God is instructed us on what to do with people. He's put us on that path. And fortunately, uh, we love doing it. So we talk to anybody that would like some information. And you know what? <laughs> the greatest thing that's happened in the last year, I guess, is normal people are starting to look. <laughs> that's the only way I can put it. Normal people, those that want to learn, that have this heart for learning, and one of connecting to God and honoring Him. Anybody have anything else they want to say? Is Shira home yet? No, she'll be home a week from a week from today. Actually, we seen her picture today. That was pretty cool. It's very they just got a horde of grandchildren. <laughs> She's got, I think there's fourteen of them. I don't know. I didn't count them, but she has six kids and. Between them, they got about 14 grand. That's one of the reasons she went. She had a new granddaughter just born. So, and by the way, none of them are Jewish. Shira converted. And of course, the kids, they don't have to convert. <clears throat> and she grew them up. She took them out of churches. And they would do a homeschooling on Wednesday evenings at their house because the kids were involved in sports and they were doing sports every other day but Wednesday. And um, most not most of them do not go to church. She has one son who's Pentecostal, but I think he's getting ready to move out of that. But the others have stopped going to church. One of her little granddaughters said to her about three months ago, guess what, Bam Bam, they call her Bam Bam, I don't know why. And she doesn't either. Uh, her first grandchild evidently couldn't say Graham or something like that. So it came out Bam. 
so they called her Bam Bam. This little girl, who's I think four years old, she calls up her grandmother and says, guess what, we don't go to church anymore. She was so proud. And they live in a town where the second question out of most people's mouth when they meet you is, what's your name and what church you belong to? I live across the street from that one. <laughs> <laughs> the whole town there is a bubble in Abilene. Uh, there's no Jews within three hours of there, I think. So, but hey, that's that's God has a reason for everything. God has there's a reason everything is the way it is. We don't understand it; it's beyond our comprehension. But we do know that God understands why He's doing things, and that's the important thing. Just trust in Him. So, if this is what He's going to do, this is the way it is. So, go I ahead. Have go. I have to go. <laughs> yeah, we're leaving too. Thank you for coming. I hope you come back next week. I, I will. I will. I, I can um, have organize my life better now that I um, have retired. So, I certainly will. It's lovely to see all your faces. You see the names and hear things. But um, it's actually like all being together. And I think that's a nice feeling. Well, it is for me anyway. Good. Maybe Thanks. you share it with some of the people that follow you around. Maybe they'll come too. Yes. Yes. Thank, sure. thank you for coming. Thank you thank so you much. All. It was really nice meeting you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bless you bye -bye. all. Bye. You can turn the recorder off now. All right. You want to say a, you want to say a, a goodbye? <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't say goodbye. <laughs> Okay, folks, uh, if you've made it to this part of the recording, bless you, and thank you for doing that. If you have any questions, get a hold of myself, get a hold of Terry, uh, get other people involved, get together. We're here just trying to do what God wants us to do, and uh, we bless you all. We send you our blessings, all of us. Okay. Amen. Bye-bye.